Here's an example where we have some surface and we have a vector field and we want to find the flux of the curl, right? We're looking at the alignment of not the vector field but the curl of the vector field, which is another vector field. We're looking at the alignment of the curl to the normal to the surface. We're finding the flux of the curl. Um, now, Green's theorem, or Stokes' theorem, we normally um, would use it this way. We want to find a circulation integral. We turn it into a surface integral. But sometimes we use it the other way. If we have an integral that's the flux of the curl, we could turn it back into some circulation integral. It may be that the circulation integral is actually easier to do than the original integral. So we'll just be on the lookout for that. Now, it might seem kind of weird to be integrating not the, not the flux of the vector field, but the curl of the vector field. But then the curl of vector fields does come up in lots of calculations. For example, in Maxwell's equations in electromagnetics, um, the, those equations do involve the curl of the electric field and the curl of the magnetic field. So it's not so uncommon to see an integral that involves the flux of the curl. All right, so let's look at our surface first. Our surface, they tell us, is a parabolic shell. Um, let's see, so we have y is 4 minus 4x squared minus z squared. So I'm going to look at this surface. There's x and y and z. If I set x equal to 0, then I get y is 4 minus z squared. That's going to be a parabola that's opening back, starting at y equals 4. When z equals 0, as z gets bigger, the y value gets more and more negative. So we have a problem of opening back in the yz plane. If we set z equal to 0, then we're in the xy plane, and we have another problem opening back. Only because of the 4 here, it, uh, it opens back a little bit faster. So it's a little bit narrower in this direction. So this is really an, an elliptic um, paraboloid. We're only interested in the part where um, y is greater than or equal to 0 from the bounds. So Really, we just have the part that maybe looks like a bullet or a gumdrop on its side. That's the surface. And Stokes' theorem says if you want to find the flux of the curl through the surface, you can just integrate around the boundary curve, which is just a simple ellipse. So it might be worth it to trade, this, to trade setting up a parameterization for this surface and um, calculating your area conversion factor and calculating your normal it might be worth it just to um, just to do the circulation integral instead. But to do the circulation integral, we're going to have to parametrize this ellipse first. So let's, let's see, here's the x-axis and here's the z-axis. Kind of looking back from this side, so my eye is here looking at this so that the positive x-axis is to my right and the positive z-axis is up. Now, I've got this ellipse, so let's see, the ellipse when, um, when y is equal to 0, we have 4x squared plus z squared equals 4. So we have x squared over, let's see, just x squared plus z squared over 4 is 1. So that, in the, that ellipse has major axis that's uh, plus or minus 2 from the center, which is at the origin, and minor axis that's plus or minus 1 from the center, so it's an ellipse like this. Now we need to set up a parameterization of that ellipse. First we've got to figure out what direction are we going around. Are we going around um, clockwise from my point of view or are we going counterclockwise? And the way to answer that is to look at the normal you're supposed to be using in the flux integral. It says the unit, outer unit normal, so they mean by that they mean the normal away from the origin. So standing on the surface, the one that's away from the origin would be the one that's out like this. The one that's in towards the origin goes inside the shell here. So we want, we want this one that's pointing out away. Now to figure out which way we should do the circulation, put your right hand out, put your thumb in the direction of that normal, and then let your fingers curl naturally. Then as you, as you, as you move your hand along the surface till the edge, you'll see that your, when your fingers get to the edge, they're curling in this direction. So that means we're going in the direction where we start with um, we, we, we start with z here and we're moving in the direction of positive x. So as seen from the point of view of my eye here, that is moving clockwise. So we need to set up a clockwise parameterization of this ellipse. Now, we know this is pretty close to our identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So I'm going to try setting x to be sine t and z to be 2 cosine t. 
Um, that way, x squared plus z squared over 4 would be sine squared plus cosine squared. That would be 1. So if x and z satisfy this relationship, they lie on this ellipse. I just need to go all the way around the ellipse. The ellipse so t goes from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so I've got my parameterization set up. That's the first thing that I need for this integral. In order to do f dot t, I'm going to have to calculate r prime of t. So remember, when you're doing the integral of, you're doing a, a, a circulation integral here of f dot t ds, you're going to change it into uh, a one-dimensional integral. So you're going to write f in terms of your parameter, little t. And you're going to get your unit tangent by taking the velocity divided by the speed. And you're going to get ds here. You're going to get a little bit of arc length by taking the speed times the change in time, since rate times time is distance traveled. So there's ds and there's t. And I just have to integrate from 0 to 2 pi. So you can see I don't have to calculate the norm of the velocity. I don't need the speed. All I need to do is to calculate f dot r prime of t. So here's my parameterization, r, right? So r prime can be the derivative of the x-coordinate, um, which is cosine t. And the derivative of the y-coordinate, the y-coordinate's always 0, because we're in the xz plane. So the derivative of 0 is still 0. And then the derivative of the z-coordinate is going to be minus 2 sine t. OK, so there's r prime. Now what we need to do. Um, now what we need to do is calculate f dotted with r prime of t. So let's calculate the dot product of those two. So we have here for our, our vector f dotted with r prime. We're going to take cos and t times this. Now from our parameterization, z is 2 cos and t. So we have negative 2 cos and t plus 1 over 2 plus x. Um, I'm doing a dot product so there won't be a it won't be a vector at all. It'll be a scalar. Let's see. So we have cos and t times uh, z would be cos and t times negative 2 cos t. So that would be negative 2 cos and squared t. OK, plus 1 over 2 plus x times cos and t would be cos and t over 2 plus x. But from parameterization, x is sine t. And then 0 times this arctan, so that doesn't even figure in. And then minus 2 sine t times x, but x is uh, sine t. So if you take minus 2 sine t times x here, that's two, minus 2 sine t times sine t, that's minus 2 sine squared t. And then we take minus 2 sine t times 1, plus, uh, one over 4 plus z. So um, minus 2 sine t over 4 plus z, but z is 2 cos t. OK, so that scalar is f dot r prime. That's what I need to integrate with respect to t from 0 to 2 pi here. OK, well, I can see that this actually simplifies a little bit. Let me come over here. Um, we have negative 2 times cosine squared, but also negative 2 times sine squared. So those do combine to make negative 2. So I got that figured out. And um, this I could pull out a 2. Let's see, I get 2 plus 1 cosine t. And I pull out that 2, it cancels here. So I have plus cosine t over 2 plus sine t minus sine t over 2 plus cos t. All right. Fair enough. That um, all those integrals could be could be done, and really not too bad actually. So we just have to integrate that from zero to two pi with respect to t. Now this integral is neg the antiderivative of negative two is negative two t. This, the, the derivative of sine is cosine, so this is a natural log. Let's see, it would be the natural log of 2 plus um, sine t, right? Because the derivative of the natural log of something is the derivative of the inside, which would be cosine, over the inside, which is 2 plus sine t. Hey, the derivative of, co of 2 plus cosine t is minus sine t. So this one is plus the natural log of 2 plus cosine t. 
All right, you can check that, right? Because the derivative of the natural log would be the derivative of the, of the inside, which would be the derivative of cosine, which is minus sine, all over the inside, which is 2 plus cosine t. Yeah, these are good antiderivatives. All right, so I just have to evaluate those between 0 and 2 pi. Let's see what we get. So negative 2 times 2 pi would be negative 4 pi, minus negative 2 times 0 would be 0. So we get negative 4 pi from the first term. And then from the second term, when you plug in 2 pi, the sine is 0, so you get the natural log of 2. Minus, when you plug in 0, it's 0, so you get minus the natural log of 2. And then when you plug 2 pi into cosine, you get 1, so you get the natural log of 3 minus the natural log, when you plug 0 into cosine, you get 1. Um, so you get the natural log of 3 again. So the minus natural log of 3 cancels the plus natural log of 3, and the minus natural log of 2 cancels the plus natural log of 2, and the integral, the answer we get is minus 4 pi. So we figured out that the flux of the curl is minus 4 pi, but we never set up a surface integral, we just did a circulation integral, and the reason we could do that was because of Stokes' theorem.